So uh, welcome everyone to the Ilm Tech Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in for this episode. I'm really excited for it. Uh, we have with us today Dr. Chet Moritz from the University of Washington. I'm going to get it right this time. Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, Department of Physiology and Biophysics, and Department of Rehabilitation Medicine. That's right. He's in all three departments. So why don't we start with that? What's the story with the three departments? It's like... Great question. It's called being indecisive. Right? I couldn't <laughs> decide which department to join. So I started out in physiology and biophysics uh, as a new uh, research professor and then got a fantastic job offer in rehabilitation medicine, uh, teaching physical therapy students, but I didn't want to give up my appointment in, in physiology and biophysics, so they were kind enough to keep me on as a joint. All right. And then similar thing happened here with our new Center for Neurotechnology. That's an engineering research center. Needed to have a home in engineering, and electrical and computer engineering was kind enough to take me on as well. So I'm, I've been adopted several times, <laughs> but I've always maintained good relationships with my old parents. <laughs> yeah, actually, I actually think that's really awesome. That was one of the coolest things for me because I think myself and a lot of people are similar I think in this day and age mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. people are more and more interested in so many different things so uh, at least for me it was a big struggle like all right what do I even want to major in mm -hmm. uh, I want to do all this different kind of stuff so um, that's really cool uh, I was looking at um, your like your educational background a little bit and you did your undergrad mm -hmm. here in mm -hmm. zoology right zoology that's right and that was the joke at the time what yeah. do you do work in a zoo and, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we didn't have biology back then. We had a zoology department and a botany department, and they later merged. There was no biology at all. There was no biology department. There was no biology major. So you either wanted to study plants, that was botany, or animals, that was zoology. And right about the time I graduated in 1998, they started a biology department. The two merged together, which is how oh, it is okay. almost everywhere else. So now you could, the same degree I got would be called biology with a physiology emphasis. Uh, but yeah, that was the big joke, right? I'm going to work in a zoo. Can and sure enough, I did. For, oh, they totally did. It was a zoology <laughs> major, man. Um, so it doesn't sound particularly applicable, but it's your basic pre-med physiology type degree. That right. was the, the option at the time. Okay. So when you were an undergrad at that time, were you thinking about, like, did you see yourself doing all this kind of stuff later on? Or what, not, what was not your Not really. Time? No, you know, I thought maybe medical school, but I'm not really the right kind of person to be a doctor. I ask too many questions. <laughs> um, and so I wanted to be a physical therapist. I thought that sounded like fun. And then I had this amazing psychology class, physiological psych, how the brain works. And this is before neuroscience really had a name. It really wasn't a field. There were no yeah. neuroscience degrees, no neuroscience departments. And so I had this physiological psych professor who was just amazing. And two things happened during that. I thought, wow, I really want to do research because that's cool. And I really want to be a professor because this guy's such an amazing instructor. So what was amazing really about him? Just the way he taught the class was so, there were so many stories. It was so engaging. And he kind of, it was old school now, right? We're not supposed to lecture anymore. We're supposed to do all active learning. But he just yeah. told these amazing stories about different parts of the brain and people that have had damage mm -hmm. in different parts of the brain and how it affected their lives and their behavior. And it was just so incredibly engaging. I thought, wouldn't that be fun to tell stories like that and get students excited about the field? Right. Um, and then, of course, by the time I became a professor, active learning and flipped classrooms and all that were all the rage and they don't let us lecture anymore. But whatever, I still enjoy <laughs> I still enjoy teaching. So Really? Is that a thing? They, I feel like a lot of professors do still lecture. Yeah, you can still lecture. They're just encouraging us to use active learning. And it, it actually works pretty well. I do a mix now. I do... I ask some questions, I let people discuss in small groups, and then they we talk about it as a big group, and then I, I give a few slides of lecture in between before asking another question. Oh, yeah. I think that's pretty good. That works for me as well, generally. like, I think you need a good balance. It's a mix. Yeah. But honestly, it depends how good the lecture is. Because if the lecture is good, then I don't mind. You can talk for, you know, 30 minutes, an hour, exactly. like, whatever. Exactly. Um, I've had some mentors. Mark Binder, he's still teaching on campus now. He teaches a lot of uh, freshman oh, yeah. seminars now. He's the most amazing lecturer I've ever listened to. I mean, it's just like poetry listening to him lecture. Wow. So if you get a chance to take a class with him, Mark with a C, Binder, check it out. He Wait, what does he teach? He teaches a different class every year. This is the coolest thing. He taught oh, like, wow. I'm going to get them all wrong because he just told me the examples, but it was something like, you know, mid-Gothic poetry, and then the next quarter it was like culinary skills and stuff. He, just, he likes learning new things. He's basically retired, yeah. but he's not officially retired, so he teaches a freshman, essentially like a That's freshman interest cool. group kind of class every year, yeah. and it's a different topic every year, and he does an amazing job, so check it out if you get a chance. That's pretty cool. Pretty cool. All right, so um, on to your research a little bit. Uh, on your bio it says you're developing treatments for paralysis using brain-computer interfaces and neurotechnology. Um, 
I probably can't explain it as well as you can, so definitely can you go into that a little bit? Sure, yeah. yeah. It's kind of a mouthful, right? So the short take-home message is we're trying to cure paralysis. Yeah. And we believe that the technology now has, a, has come to the point where we actually think we can be successful. So one way we tried to approach this was with a brain-computer interface. Could we read out someone's thoughts, someone's intention to move, um, and could we play that back through their paralyzed muscles or through their paralyzed spinal cord and actually uh -huh. cause their hands and arms to move? And we right. showed about 10 years ago that in an animal model that this was possible. And it's been exciting because there's two different groups around the country now that are doing this in human subjects now, and it looks like it's working. Um, but in the meantime, we stumbled across something really interesting, which was that just stimulating the spinal cord, even without the brain-computer interface, made a lot of people better. Mm -hmm. And those aren't people with totally complete injuries. The brain is not totally separated from the spinal cord, but they might still be paralyzed to the point where they can't move their fingers at all. And we found that if you stimulated the spinal cord electrically, at the same time as you had them do exercises, rehabilitation, they started moving again when they hadn't in years. They started feeding themselves, they started doing all these things, and the most miraculous part was that we turned the stimulator off and we could wait for weeks right. or months and all of those movements would stick around. Yeah. So it was neuroplasticity, right? It was some kind of permanent change in that injured spinal cord. So that got us really excited that we might be on the cusp. We and other groups around the country who were more focused on walking, we're really focused on hand movement, might be on the cusp of a technology that could help cure paralysis. Oh, I see, okay. That's pretty cool because um, when I was first reading about it or thinking about it, I thought it was like kind of a, like it was definitely really cool, but kind of a weird idea, right? Like like you said, the idea that you're going to electrically stimulate a muscle to like heal it, like from an outsider perspective, it kind of seems like, you know, like an old TV's not working, you smack it and it starts working again. I was like, you know, how do you even discover that or think about that? Sure, so, sure. Yeah, so it's, it's all, of course, <laughs> accidental because that's how the best science happens. Yeah. But it's basically this idea that we're using the electrical stimulation like an amplifier. So the brain and the spinal cord have been mostly disconnected because of spinal cord injury, but there's mm -hmm. still a few wires that connect them. But those wires are weak, they've lost their insulation, we call that myelin. So they might conduct electrical impulses, but they, they sort of fade away on the way of the spinal cord. They don't make it there. If they make it there, they're not strong enough to do anything. But what we found is if we put this electrical stimulator on the spinal cord, we can basically turn up the gain, we can turn up the amplification on the spinal cord, uh -huh. such that even those weak signals coming down from the brain, so think of like your little headphone jack and you can barely hear with your earbud, but if we were to put an amplifier, right, on those headphones, like a nice pair of noise yeah. canceling headphones, you could hear a lot better, right? Same one volt signal coming out of your phone or your mm -hmm. laptop, but we've now amplified it at the source, so it sounds a lot louder, sounds a lot clearer. Yeah. And then, well, so just amplifying it's cool. And that makes people about yeah. twice as strong, almost immediately. Uh, but then, because it's amplified, they can hear a lot better, they can move a lot better. And mm -hmm. when they use that movement to do a ton of exercise, a ton of practice, that's what causes the, the brain and the spinal cord to rewire in ways that are more productive. So they become more connected. Those wires get more myelin on them, more wires might mm -hmm. grow, those wires might branch and grow circuits wow. around the injury. We don't know the exact mechanisms yet. All those have been seen in animal models. Um, but the cool thing is it's as simple as putting the amplifier on, putting the hearing aid on the spinal cord, and then with a lot of practice, a lot of hard work, people grow new connections and you, then you can turn the, the stimulator off, right? You can take away the amplifier and they stay connected, they stay recovered, which is really exciting. So I always thought like, I guess they teach in intro classes that neural tissue doesn't regrow, mm -hmm. right? So like, how does that happen? Exactly, so in the central nervous system, brain and spinal cord, the dogma is once you're an adult, no neurons grow, yeah. no neurons, um, certainly they don't grow long distances, they don't divide, right? Yeah. But what they do do is they sprout. So they, they can make little tiny side connections from their axons or from their synapses uh -huh. and make a few more synapses with a local connection. They can also add wraps of myelin. So they can add more layers of insulation, which makes the electricity coming through them go farther or be stronger when it gets there. Right. So we think that's what's happening. We don't think we're regrowing new neurons all the way from the brain to the spinal okay, cord. That's, that happens, but only when you transplant stem cells and other things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's hard to get that to happen in the adult. But what we do think happens is, for example, if there's just a few wires passing through the lesion and they don't ever really ever cause a good effect downstream, they may not even have any synapses or they may have some synapses that have withered away. And if you mm -hmm. can reinforce them, so heavy in plasticity, these rules about learning and memory and, and change in the nervous system says if you repeatedly pair the activity of a neuron upstream and neuron downstream, they will grow more and stronger synapses together. 
Right. So we think that's what's happening is we're putting more receptors in these synapses, maybe sprouting little side channels and growing an extra synapse so it's twice as strong, mm -hmm. maybe sprouting sideways and connecting to another group of neurons that we didn't connect with before. So right. that's all documented to happen in the adult central nervous system. And this is like really recent work, right? Because um, you recently wrote an article, I was looking at it, it, you said that now is the critical time for engineered neuroplasticity. Exactly. So why is now that time? Yeah, so it's all within the last three to five years that these results have started coming in. And it's this idea that we didn't really expect devices to be able to make a long-term change in the nervous system. We expected, uh -huh. as we talked about before, the device could maybe hotwire the nervous system, right? We could shock it, cause the muscle to twitch. Yeah. Maybe that would be useful if it was under a brain-computer interface control. Maybe we could tell the hand when to grab a cup of water or let it go. But in using those systems, we realized that actually just shocking the nervous system causes the nervous system to start to heal. And that's what we mean by engineered plasticity. So it's a smashing together two words, right? Engineered is devices or algorithms yeah, or, yeah. or stimulation. And plasticity is this idea that the brain and the spinal cord can change themselves. They can rewire themselves yeah. Yeah, for a long period of time. So by engineering plasticity, we're taking a device and we're actually steering those connections in the brain and the spinal cord to productive places, mm -hmm. right? We're saying, can we actually use this stimulator to make these axons connect in a way that'll help recovery, right? And so it's pretty cool because it's basically like a little repair technician going right. in there and saying, hey, I want to shape this electric field and grow these synapses, connect up, and then um, and then we're done. And then the technician goes away and the nervous yeah. system is not totally healed, but but more healed than it was before. Right, that's really cool. Really like um, kind of a sci-fi kind of thing, right? You see in like movies and stuff, they'll have little healing things and you just see things instantly heal. I guess it's not that, right? But It's not instant, but it's kind it's of like, that idea, it's right? It's kind of the same concept, yeah. Yeah, it's like you create this environment where it can heal, whether it's because you put drugs in there or stem cells, or in our case, mm -hmm. you put electric fields, and that promotes the healing. And then when you're done, the electric field goes away and the healing stays, as far as we can tell, three to six months, as long as we can measure. Uh, so it's nearly permanent, which is exciting. So what happens after those three to six months? Why does it go away then? Well, it doesn't necessarily go away. That's when we stop following the subjects. Oh, so every okay. research point has to have an endpoint because you gotta publish the paper, you gotta let the people All go right, back to right. their lives. And so we only follow people routinely for three months. And okay. to date, almost everyone's maintained perfectly at three months. We had just a unique opportunity to measure someone again at six months, and they were down just the tiniest bit from three to six months, but definitely not back to where they started. So I won't say it goes away. I'll okay. say that as long as we can measure, it sticks around. So is that is like cool. a big struggle? Like you probably can't um, have that many subjects for people to uh, that you can actually test, right? Yeah, we're working with about eight or nine people right now, which is exciting, but it's oh, yeah. a lot of their time, right? They yeah. come in three days a week for four months to get this therapy. We follow them for a month before and three months after to see how stable they are on right. either end. Um, but we have to be really conscious of their time commitment as well, right? They right, want to get back right. to their lives. Some of them moved to Seattle just for this. They oh, live wow. here for four months. They travel back for the follow-up visits, but that's partly why we can't just always test at six yeah, months and 12 yeah, months yeah. and 18 months, right? We can't they commit, right? They sign a consent form and they say that I'm enrolling in this study and it would be kind of ridiculous to ask somebody to commit for a five year. Right. I mean, you could, but people would drop out. Some people wouldn't be interested. They'd say, I don't know where I'm going to be in five years. Maybe I can't commit to that. So. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Um, switching gears a little bit, you're, you're the co-director for the Center for Neurotechnology, the NSF um, center over here. So, like, you have all these different things you do that you're everywhere, man. Like... <laughs> What does that look like for you? Everywhere and nowhere. It's the secret of having three offices and you're never in any one of them. <laughs> right. um, yeah, it's a lot of fun actually. So the Center for Neurotechnology is yeah. a center funded by the National Science Foundation. Right. It's one of their engineering research centers and it's, it's basically the crown jewel of NSF um, centers. So it's about four million a year for 10 years and we mostly fund graduate students. So mm -hmm. we fund students at, here at UW, at MIT, at San Diego State and at Caltech. And the cool thing about that is it brings together all the students, all the faculty to work on one problem. And our problem is engineered neuroplasticity. Mm -hmm. So we address it for people with spinal cord injury, we address it for people with stroke, and for people with Parkinson's disease or essential tremor. So they have this uncontrolled shaking of their hands. Right. And we use implanted deep brain stimulators to address that. So it's a very exciting place to be because we're at the intersection of medicine, engineering, science, neuroscience, and ethics which is awesome. We have neuroethicists, right? We basically created right. the field of neuroethics about 10 years ago. Yeah. So you can imagine we're putting devices in your brain that are going to change your brain. 
right? I mean, that's the point right. is yeah. to heal your brain, but that means rewiring your brain. So is that yeah. ethical to do? Well, we better ask some philosophers who are experts <laughs> in this and work together with them right from the beginning to figure out whether this is an ethical thing to do. Yeah. And we believe that it is in the case of stroke or um, tremor where mm -hmm. you have a medical condition. We're not sure it is if you don't have a medical condition, right? And you want to maybe become smarter. You want to use augmentation, right? You can imagine the same device might make you smarter right. if it was used in a different way. And there's some really serious debates going on right now in the community about the ethics around that. And those are important conversations to have. Yeah, so I'm actually a little bit curious about those conversations because the thing with me about, you know, everyone talks about ethics a lot and they're like, all right, you know, ethics is super important. But like, how productive can those conversations really be when you're debating something that's inherently subjective? Like, you know, people have, people have different belief systems um, based on, it can be like the culture, religion, for example, you know, I'm a Muslim. So from my faith, I'll have a different idea as opposed to you or someone else, right? Sure. So like, I get, when it comes to like science or something, you can debate pretty clearly, you can bring your evidence, you can bring proof and all that kind of stuff. So this is inherently subjective, you know? So how do those conversations end up going? Sure, so they end up becoming really interesting conversations. And the nice thing is they do, they float above whatever sort of personal morals or ethics people might have. And we yeah. really talk about societal impact and equity and fairness and privacy, right? Mm -hmm. So I'll give you the dystopian example if you want a crazy example for your All podcast. Right. <laughs> um, so let's imagine that, and there's and there's people working on this now, so it's not as far flung as it sounds, right? There's a couple really smart entrepreneurs who've started companies explicitly to add artificial intelligence to your brain, right? That's right. the goal of the company. We can go into details later. All good people, no disrespect. But let's imagine they're successful. So 10 years from now, you can purchase a device, it goes in your brain, and you can search Google by thinking about it. You meet someone at a cocktail party and you remember you know, their name, their spouse's name, their kids, where you saw them last, their school, some fun facts, right? So you're just yeah. this amazing social butterfly, right? Because you can just look at, like Terminator, right? The information right, comes right, up right, on the right. screen, except it just comes up straight in your consciousness. Okay, so let's imagine this is available, but it requires a neurosurgery to put it in. Now, neurosurgery is minimum to get in the door of the operating room, $30,000, $40,000. So oh, wow, yeah. in today's dollars. So not super accessible to most people. But that's okay, we got a solution for that. Most people can't afford their iPhone either, but their data services plan is happy to provide them one at a reduced cost, or maybe even free, in exchange for a two-year contract, or, but maybe this is a brain implant, so let's call it a 10-year contract. Yeah. Now imagine this, your brain data is so valuable to company X, right, whether it's Google, Apple, oh, <laughs> Microsoft, that they're happy to front $30,000 and put this in your brain in exchange for just, oh, it's it's anonymized brain data, you know, we just kind of want to know what you're thinking, yeah. <laughs> and we want to be able to push some context-specific ads into your consciousness, and, you know, hey, we noticed you're feeling a little down here in Seattle in February, and so we pushed a little trip to Hawaii, just right about the time of day when we've noticed that you make oh, lots man. of one-click purchases on Amazon using your brain implant, right, because you no longer have to even talk to your smart speaker to do stuff, you can just think yeah. it, Yeah. and so this is all cool, right? It's It helps you, right? It helps you get through your daily life except that you've completely given up your privacy. You might have even given up your, your, your agency, your sense of agency. Yeah. These are the terms we talk about with ethicists. Agency is the idea you're in control of your own actions. Right. So imagine that your brain implant, well, I noticed you were a little depressed. That's okay, it can treat that. It can stimulate a certain part of your brain to treat depression. There's devices being worked on right now for that. Mm -hmm. And it's, it works pretty well. A little dopamine gets released, you feel better. That's cool. Well, you know, your brain implant kind of predicts that you're not going to feel so well and it makes you feel better, right? That sounds good. Yeah. Except that then your brain implant can make you feel better than better and maybe make you make purchasing decisions that you wouldn't otherwise make. And so there's already a precedent for this. So people with deep brain stimulators for Parkinson's huh. disease, one of the common side effects is that they experience compulsive behavior. So they might gamble in a way, they might go to Vegas and gamble all their money away in a way that they wouldn't have done before. They might make inappropriate sexual mm -hmm. comments in a way that they right. never did before. And when they do that, they feel great because they feel euphoric, they feel optimistic yeah. because the stimulator has this side effect of making their brain feel more optimistic than it would otherwise. But their family around them are saying, hey, wait, you've got a gambling problem, you've got a, a behavior problem. Yeah. And so who owns the device? Who owns the implant? Right? Who can turn it off? Oh, yeah. And the people say, well, no, this is my body. I feel great. Don't touch the stimulator settings. And the family's like, you're kind of out of control. So imagine right. this going to the extreme. You've given up all your privacy. You're euphoric all the time. You're buying things like mad. You're compulsive, right? You're spending money like mad. 
And if that's not bad enough, we think about access, right? So this is something everyone can agree on. Now, it turns out that these big data companies, your data is only valuable if you have a certain amount of purchasing power, right? Because we can push ads, you click, right, you right, buy. Right. So guess what? The people from different socioeconomic classes, well, maybe they don't qualify for the free data plan. And then you get this entire, like, you can get this divided society, right? Exactly. As you if know. we don't have one already, now right. you've got the haves and the have-nots and the haves or have all this artificial intelligence at their fingertips, yeah. their brain tips, the have-nots are unable to access the information or certainly not, not without using a computer. Um, and so now you've got this dystopian society yeah. <laughs> where it turns out the have-nots are actually probably in a better shape because they have privacy and they're in control of their own behavior, but the haves feel like they own the world because... Right, and that, that, gives, the, that gives the haves the ability to exploit the have-nots, even, I guess, even more that's happening. Yeah, so I would say any religion could agree <laughs> right. that kind of outcome is probably not what we're looking for, so that's yeah. the kind of conversations we have. I find them fascinating, yeah. and I also find them important, because hopefully we won't get to quite that dystopian future, right. but I wouldn't be surprised if we're on our way to something that looks like it, even without a brain implant, right? So just kind of thinking about the parallels in our own society, yeah. and then thinking about how that might get better or worse if we even have right. just a simple brain interface that you know is meant to make you smarter hey maybe it helps you pass the SAT or whatever you guys are doing these days the GRE although we're gonna get rid of the GRE but um, you know that's cool I got this little implant help me ace the GRE um, but what else did it do and who was able to get it and who wasn't yeah so. yeah so but you know I just had a thought isn't this sort of already happening in the sense that what the media is doing right media is what a stimulus to your brain uh it's maybe not as direct but it has kind of the same effect right you're, you're, the media is subconsciously telling people what to think it's you know um facebook's already reading all your data from what you do and monitoring what you do so i'm smiling and nodding because thing. i didn't make this up right all yeah. i did was talk <laughs> about it being in your brain yeah so it's already happening and i think this is what's incumbent on all of us as engineers right if you're building a new app you've got to think about the ethics of the app. It's like, yeah, sure, it hooks people in through dopamine and through social right, feedback, right. and so they want to click and tweet and, and Snapchat and whatever your kids do these days. Um, but but you got to think about the downsides, right? you got to think about how things are manipulated and right, how yeah. we get into our little filter <laughs> bubbles and we kind of don't lose touch with reality and we lose mm -hmm. touch with our neighbor across the street. So it's, yeah, I painted that as a dystopian picture, but there's a lot of parallels to what's already happening. So here's the crazy thing, though. Right now... Nobody really has a problem with that, or I guess, I mean, we all say it's bad, but everyone's still using social media, everyone is still, no one's really that um, active against it, it's not like this is some great evil we need to fight against, you don't hear that narrative. So could you imagine like, in the kind of dystopian future you described that eventually people would just not even think it's wrong anymore and it'll just become ingrained as a part of society, there's a lot of things we don't think are wrong right now, just because we grow up with those values. So that's, yeah, that's my worry. That's my worry <laughs> that it'll happen gradually enough or that it'll be such a smooth transition from what we're already doing. And people say this all the time. They say, well, why are we worried about augmentation? I've already got a phone. That's augmentation, right? I mean, 10 years ago, I couldn't just search anything I wanted to in my hand. Yeah. Right? So I'm already augmented. Who cares if it's implanted? And I think the critical difference, and hopefully where society will realize this, is that when it's implanted, you can't just leave it on the table and walk out of the room. You can't go to one of those parties. I don't know if you guys at your age are aware of this, but adults now go to these retreats where they put all their electronic devices in the middle of the table and they're not allowed to look at them. It's called tech detox. Okay. Right? Because literally people have become so addicted to their social media and their digital devices that people pay, these are like middle-aged you know, business people, pay lots of money to go to a weekend camp where they're all required to put their phones and their laptops and their Apple Watches in the middle of the table and no one's allowed to look at them. And, and actually have a conversation with the people around the table, right? Which is, is totally retro. But um, yeah. so that so it's already people are starting to realize that it's a problem. The current media is a right. Problem. But at least we can put our phones away. I mean, one of my favorite things to do on the weekend is go surfing. Why do I like right. going surfing? I'm a terrible surfer, right? I'm a kook, if you know what you surfing is. You look like a guy that surfs. I'm though. a kook, right? Which means I don't know what I'm doing. I mean, I know how to stay out of people's way. That's the only thing I'm good at. But why do I like it? Because my devices aren't waterproof. So they've got to stay in the car. Right? right, my phone stays in the car, my computer stays in the car. I don't have one of the fancy watches yet, but um, I guess those are why. Actually, that freaked me out the other day because my buddy paddles out next to me, and he pulls up next to me and he starts shouting into his watch, <laughs> and I was like, "What are you doing?" 
And he's yeah. like, I got this Apple Watch. It's got the phone link. And someone just called to ask how the waves were. And I'm trying to answer them, but they can't hear me. Because yeah. the speaker is like full of water or something. Right. And I was like, and that's actually when I realized why I went surfing. I never knew beforehand. I was like, why do I paddle out here? I never catch any waves. Um, but I like, I just like being there. Go? I like go to Oregon or Westport or what, you know, okay. I just like being out in the yeah, ocean, right? Yeah, and, yeah. But I figured out why I liked it that day because <laughs> I didn't like listening to him yell at his watch. Right. And I was like, I like it here because no one can call me, no one can text me, no one can email me, and yeah, no one yeah. expects to be able to get a hold of me. Right. But everywhere else I go, right, my office phone forwards to my cell, my email, my text, I'm expected to be like on all the time. Right. Except when I'm in the water. So extend that to the devices in your brain. Now yeah. you can't even put down your phone while you take a shower, right? You're getting thoughts are being pushed to your head. Text messages are being pushed to your head from your whoever, your yeah. spouse, your friends. And, they, and they, they get mad when they don't get an answer because they're like, I know you got it. Yeah. Because yeah. it's always on. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. And so instead of being like, oh, sorry, dude, I left my phone in the car. I didn't hear your text. Yeah. It's yeah, like, yeah. no excuse, man. I know you got it. You, it never turns off. Right, right, right. Yeah, so, you know, thinking about all these things, all these, like, uh, potentially negative outcomes, uh, I'm curious, like, you do all this work, and I was reading your CV, you've got, like, I don't even know how many publications, like, so many, so much work so and research and everything. So, how do you stay motivated to keep working on it? You know, like, you're, you're doing all these different things, three different departments, you know, co-director, all this kind of stuff you're doing. A lot of people struggle with the day-to-day -day motivation to even get up and go to class, or to get up and do their one job. So how do you stay motivated, especially when you know that a lot of the things that you're involved in could go either way, you know? Exactly. And the research sometimes goes poorly, right? And so for 10 years, we tried stuff and it didn't work, right? That's just research, especially yeah. research in spinal cord injury. Because for yeah. centuries, nothing has, basically nothing has worked yeah. in chronic spinal cord injury. Acute care has gotten better. People have healed better right after the injury. But I'll tell you what keeps me coming to work every day, and that's just helping people. And it sounds trite and it sounds simple, but mm. I finally figured this out about myself. What do I like about my job? I like teaching because I like talking to students and seeing them learn and answering their questions. Yeah. And I like going into the lab and watching a person with a spinal cord injury get a tiny half a percent better at squeezing on a little force transducer, which yeah. to most people would seem meaningless. But when you talk to the person about it and hear how it's changing their life, that's yeah. what gets you out of bed in the morning. And there's going to be some videos and stuff coming out, hopefully in the next couple months, um, that'll show uh -huh. our, our star participant. He's okay if we use his name. His name's John. He's had a spinal cord for 13 years. He was a jazz guitar player Yeah. at one point early in his life. Couldn't play guitar at all. He could barely move his left hand, maybe make one chord. Right hand, couldn't hold a pick, couldn't strum the strings. Right. And, and working with him over the last four months, he's now back to like jam sessions and he can play oh, wow. every chord right down to the neck, he can strum with his thumb, and he's worked super hard to get there, right? This is not, I'm not tooting my own horn at all, this is all John. He came in for an hour of therapy, and then he'd go home and he'd practice guitar for six hours afterwards while oh, he wow. had the after effect of the stimulator. Yeah. But talking to him, and actually a podcast interview will come out in about two weeks, so I'll, I'll try to link that to you guys. Right. You can hear John's story, and then we've got the videos, we're gonna publish the paper and the videos really soon. Um, he's it, just hearing how it's changed his life, totally like brings tears to my eyes i mean right, it's just yeah. incredible like i can't imagine for 13 years not being able to use my hands right and, yeah. and he's not cured by any means right his hands still have a lot of weakness mm -hmm. but listening to him talk about how he now has hope for the future because he's seen that he can get better right he's on this very slow but upward trajectory compared to a totally flat plateau where he was for 12 13 years before we met yeah him. yeah that gets you out of bed in the morning because it's not about, you mm -hmm. know, it's not about ego. It's not about how many papers I publish. I don't actually have that many papers compared to most people. Because the really. stuff we do is, it just takes a long time. It's hard. Yeah, it takes yeah. a long time. So we don't publish very often. But what gets me out of bed in the morning is knowing that, like, maybe today I'm going to make somebody so they can, like, put the oatmeal spoon in their mouth. Right, right. When they couldn't do it yesterday. And maybe not. Probably not, actually, yeah. today. But maybe over the next 10 years, I'm going to help a couple people feed themselves so that their son doesn't have to sit there and spoon feed their dad every morning, right? Yeah, It's yeah. that kind of stuff that gets yeah. you out of bed. And I'd encourage everybody, as you're looking at careers, it doesn't matter what you work on, just work on something that's bigger than yourself, right? Work on something that helps somebody else. Right. Not just making yourself rich and looking for that IPO, but something where at the end of the day, you're like, wow, what I did today made that other person's life better. And that yeah. could be a, a social media app that makes tons of people happy and connected. That's totally cool. I mean, do it ethically, but yeah. that's cool. But just work on something 
that's bigger than yourself because we all get caught up in this ego thing right and we wake yeah. up in the morning and we're like well today i didn't get good grades like i did yesterday and i'm just so feel sorry for myself it's like yeah don't think about that think about like today i went to school and i learned how to do this because tomorrow i'm gonna make like whatever a hundred thousand people less hungry or a hundred thousand people happier yeah. or more connected or whatever your goal is i think that's one of the big things about movement especially that i think a lot of people i guess those of us who can you know, who don't have any movement issues take for granted is that physical health and mental health are really strongly connected like your physiology the way you move is so powerful like i was just struck by the statement that you just said that it gave him hope mm-hmm. playing the guitar just being able to move his hands right and so um i don't know that's just an incredible thing that like, you think it's like movement there's a lot more to it just because of how everything is connected i guess um, yeah, part yeah. of it's movement and part of it's just outlook. So people after spinal cord injury, a lot of them go through a really dark time, right? I mean, imagine this average age, what used to be in the mid-20s, now it's a little higher because a lot of our, our baby boomers are, are just getting hurt biking or skiing because they're more active. But, oh. but so imagine this, mid-20s, right? College student, you break your neck because you dove into shallow water. That's how it happens a lot. It's been a pool, oh, off wow. the side of a boat, whatever. You don't realize how shallow it is. You break your neck, yeah. you're paralyzed from the neck down for the rest of your life. That's what the doctor's gonna tell you. I'm sorry, there's no cure for spinal cord injury. You'll get a little better in the first six months. Hopefully mm-hmm. we'll get you off the ventilator. And But you're gonna be you know, in a wheelchair. Somebody's gonna be feeding you. The worst things are the things we don't even see. Your bladder doesn't work very well. Your bowels don't work very well. Yeah. Right? So those are the, we work on those things as well. But um, it's, you know, it's tough. It's a life sentence, right? And so a lot of people get really depressed for a number of years after that as they're trying to reboot and figure out what their life's going to look like. Mm-hmm. And John opened up with us about this at one point and, you know, shared that, you know, he went through a really dark time, as a lot of people do. Yeah. And, and he had to kind of reboot his life and find a new career. He's a gardener now. He, he runs a nursery here just near U District. And, um, you know, he plants plants all week and he sells them on the weekends. He sells tons of bamboo. If anybody needs bamboo, go see John. Uh, all right. That's my plug. Um, but, uh, yeah, he had to find something he could do, right. That would give him that satisfaction, right. Give him that, you know, yeah. with very limited hand movement, how could he like plant, you know, seeds basically and grow these plants and, and, and that started to turn it around for him. But the sad thing was his friends would come over with their guitars to do a jam session with him. You know, they were trying not to abandon him, but they'd all sit around in a circle and yeah. he couldn't play. And, you know, for a couple of weeks that was all right. But sooner or later they just stopped coming by because it was like, well, can't really play guitar anymore so right so we're hoping we can get him back into that into that group now yeah that's awesome yeah um so that's kind of like the utopian part right exactly you know sorry right? we're talking about the dystopian part and then that's the utopian part when it comes to the neurotech and neurotech and everything um so going a little bit beyond movement the idea that it seems a fundamental concept is like you know trying to I guess get these pathways to be more active in your research what you're working on everything is that concept translational to issues that aren't like motor related and so like issues that people might have like if we talk about like Alzheimer's or other mental health issues does it play into that at all yeah we actually think it could we don't have great evidence yet but I had a fantastic um, psychiatrist work in the lab a couple years ago his name's Alec Widge he's in Minnesota now Mm -hmm. Alec came to the lab with this exact idea he said hey you guys are working on neuroplasticity for movement disorders he said I want to work on neuroplasticity for psychiatric disorders right his example was post-traumatic stress disorder PTSD right something that happens a lot after the the conflicts in the Middle East that we had at the time right yeah a lot of soldiers still coming back with issues and so Alex's goal, and he's gotten a ton of money from, from the government to, to follow this up, is to actually use the same concept, this maybe record in one part of the brain, stimulate in another, try to get the two to wire together. But he wants to do it in the circuits that are active during fear and stress. Uh-huh. So one of the theories about why people get PTSD yeah. is that you have the amygdala, you have your fear center in the brain, and then you have your prefrontal cortex, the part that tells you everything's okay and kind of your executive function part yeah. of the cortex, right? And there's, it's thought that there's a, a weakening or a disconnection of those two areas. So when you get a trigger event, right, you hear a car backfire, something happens to trigger that PTSD event, mm-hmm. the amygdala just takes off. And it's like panic mode, right? Because this right. is what happened to you when you were in combat or when you were in your, you know, whatever bad situation happened, you give you the PTSD. Now, in most of us, the prefrontal cortex can say, oh, hey, no, I'm here, I'm safe, I'm just yeah, here on yeah. Stephen's way, I'm not right. on the front lines, right? I can shut that down. But if you have PTSD, you can't. Mm-hmm. So Alex invented this this system that can both 
shut it down as a prosthesis, right? It can both record from the prefrontal cortex and say, this is okay, I'm gonna send electrical impulses to the amygdala and inhibit it. But yeah. he's hoping that by running that circuit over and over again, just like heavy and plasticity, that the natural connections might get stronger too. So eventually right. you might not need that prosthesis anymore. He calls it a cognitive prosthesis, cognitive BCI. Um, That's awesome, yeah. Isn't that a cool idea? Yeah. And so by extension, we think that concepts like that could help with Alzheimer's. We don't still totally understand how Alzheimer's works, but yeah. if it is, you know, if it's more than just the plaques, if there's a disconnection between one part of the brain and another, maybe that can help. There's an example in memory, right? A um, couple groups, uh, Ted Berger at USC and a few other people have created a memory prosthesis that, that bypasses part of the hippocampus and helps mm -hmm. rodents, I think they tested in, in non-human primates too, remember like places, even though they lesion the middle part of the hippocampus, so it can take signals from the yeah. CA1 and stimulate CA3 and, and pass over the lesion in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, so there's examples there too, and that's partly what some of these augmentation prostheses are, are basing on, right? They're like, well, if we could enhance memory, you know, couldn't we just store oh, yeah. everything in a little CMOS chip in your brain right. and then we'll just pipe, pump it in, at the, you know, and maybe we need to, right? So maybe, there's the utopian view. Maybe for people with age-related dementia and memory loss and Alzheimer's, these kind of implants are totally justified, right? They need right, yeah. AI in their brain just to function normally. Uh -huh. Then we have to just be really conscious and really um, deliberate if we start thinking about trying to cross that augmentation line. Right. right? We've built this device to help people with memory problems sooner or later, just like Ritalin and everything else, someone's gonna get a hold of it and wanna use it to enhance their yeah. cognition. So what are, how's society gonna view that? Are they gonna allow it yeah. or not? So how do you stop something like that, right? Like if, you, if the technology's there, right, and it exists, um, like is, is it sort of like naive to think that nobody's gonna take it and use it for some kind of nefarious purpose or something, you know, like? Yeah, I think it is naive, and, yeah. the, and that's why we're trying to build the ethics into the design of the devices at this point and hopefully mitigate some of that ability to cross over and use it as um, augmentation. Right, okay. So one example would be, let's say that, um, let's say that you're worried about the data companies, you know, eventually just selling this to the public, right? Because the data is so valuable. Yeah. What if we built in the design of every implant an anonymizer that said, uh, this is Howard Chizik's idea and a few other, a few of his students, that said that information in your brain, it can't actually make it to the outside world. It's only for local processing. Right. Right. So it's like, it's okay to do closed loop in your own brain and have your own thoughts, reinforcing stimulation and everything. But before it leaves the device, before it's transmitted through your skull, it's got to be totally filtered, anonymized, and only maybe like on and off states leave your, leave your head. Okay. So yeah. if you built that in at the beginning, Maybe then if someone down the road's like, hey, you know, yeah, I found this device on eBay and I found this neurosurgeon to put it in, right? Crazy ifs, but yeah, um, yeah. they'd be like, well, the device isn't really that useful because I can't, you know, stream all my thoughts out. Or maybe the device is useful, it's super safe, right? It's super right. private because right. all your thoughts are protected. I think that's the other side of it that a lot of people don't understand that um, with not just a neurotechnology, but with technology in general, there's this entire, like, um, there's this fear that, oh man, uh, if we start having devices embedded in things, people are going to hack it for the wrong purposes and, you, and do this and that with it. Well, when you're designing a device, it's really hard to make it do what you want it to do, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's probably a lot harder to make it do something it's not even designed to do. Right, right. So, Although there are some sad stories, not to be like paranoid, but there's some sad stories of people hacking, for example, a oh, website really? for people with epilepsy. Someone hacks it and puts up movies with flashing images that flash at just the right so frame rate. Like, it's why? totally messed up. And like, this why? The, I don't get it either. But we kind of have to anticipate it. There's always going to be that like fringe of the population that whether they do it for fun or to get attention or just because they have no like empathy for other people yeah. they decide that you know like the self-driving car thing it's like well who would ever hack a self-driving car and make it crash except that there's somebody out there because they either hate the company or they think that they're going to get attention or whatever yeah. it's just going to try it or maybe there's a teenager right you guys all remember what we did as teenagers we just <laughs> did stupid stuff because we thought we could get away with it yeah right? and so you got to always assume yeah. someone out there is going to be trying to do stupid stuff because they can get away with this. You gotta build your devices, you gotta build your algorithms tight enough mm -hmm. that they can't get hacked, at least by normal means. And right. you gotta be ready to patch all the all the back doors when you find them. Right, okay, so security is a big important Security is important, right? So, so think about the brain implants. 
and think about security, right? Well, what if somebody hacked your implant and started putting thoughts in your head or actions in your head, right? Right. If you could drive behavior, even if it was as simple as just making you more or less motivated, you know, some nefarious person could make you stay in bed all day if they stimulate one part of your brain or they could make you yeah, go yeah. kind of manic and crazy all day if they stimulate another part of your brain. So, okay, maybe that doesn't have direct bad implications, but it's not something, not a situation you'd want to be in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a really important part of it. So, um, right now it seems like, or um, I guess maybe that's not as, as true now. You would probably know more about it, but uh, a lot of this research is research, right? Done on university campuses. Um, you know, we had the NSF involved in everything. How much is it moving into industry? And is this like growing a lot in industry right now? It's just starting to grow. So this is where people like Elon Musk have founded a company called Neuralink yeah. with the express goal of putting artificial intelligence in your brain. And Elon, right. I love Elon. I love his products. I drive a Tesla. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, and and Elon, and I mean no disrespect at all. Elon has said if the if the, if we don't put AI in our own brain, the bots quote are going to take over. They're going to be smarter than us. Going to wipe out the race. Okay? Yeah. I'm not making a judgment call on that at all. Um, but so he's founded this company. Another person, Brian Johnson, founded Kernel with a very similar goal. Uh, you know, both of them are starting with more health-related implications, which is good. Yeah. But their their end goal, and these are very successful entrepreneurs. Their end goal is to put AI into a healthy person's brain. Right. So that's out there, and they're hiring like mad. And there's you know there's not a lot of companies that do it, but there are enough. And so obviously we want to keep you know collaborate with them. The people I know that work there are all great people. There's no no issues. Um, but we want to also make sure we're training the next generation of neural engineers to both work at those companies, but to also work at medical device companies like the Medtronics and the Boston Scientifics and the companies that make, yeah. they started making pacemakers, now they make deep brain stimulators, they make these spinal stimulators that we test. Um, and, and, but we want to train that neural engineer to not only be an awesome engineer mm -hmm. and an awesome um, you know, neuroscientist, but also to have the ethics that we've been talking about, right? right? And that's where we have this this concentration on campus. So we have an undergraduate minor now in neural engineering. Yeah. We have, through the electrical engineering department, we have a concentration in neural engineering just launched this fall. Yeah. Um, and part of that degree program, so there's very few in the country, right? So we have one of the few minors in the country in neural engineering. There's no majors, there's no departments of neural engineering yet. But part of that is that you take at least one, probably two ethics classes, and they're fascinating, right? They're the scenarios we talked about today. Yeah. This is not like boring ethics, sit around and sleep. This is like, let's debate how my code is going to be secure so it doesn't get hacked and screw up somebody's privacy. Yeah. yeah. Um, or keep the user in control of their own lives, right? Keep their agency. Um, so it's a really unique opportunity, especially on this campus here at UW. Um, some of our partner institutions have, have courses as well. MIT has a course. Um, so it's trying to get the next generation of students not just trained but super aware because you're probably going to get hired by one of these companies and the CEO is going to be super awesome and have a vision but have yeah. no background in ethics probably. Yeah, so yeah. you're going to have to be in part that voice that says, yeah, I want to push this out but i got to make sure that I patch this vulnerability to make sure that there's uh -huh. a, no privacy issues, for example. Right, okay. Cool. Um, yeah, I can edit this part of the podcast out. Yeah, sure. So, uh, how much time do you have right now? Just like three to five more minutes. All right, yeah, cool. Sorry, we, we, can, we can wrap up. For, I think yeah. we talked about pretty much all the, the cool. I got my plug in for the. <laughs> I got my plug in for the concentration. That was like the one thing I was like yeah, trying yeah, to find yeah. a way, a natural way to get there. So yeah, I was, I, I, was, I was about to bring it up, but cool, then, then you cool. beat me to it. Yeah. yeah. Um. Okay. Let me see. I had some notes here. I think I talked about everything. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about is, um, can you have fun while being successful in research? That's the, in, in academia, because I think a lot of young people, they want to be involved in this kind of work. They want to be, you know, doing a lot of these cool things, but they're like, man, I have to work for 10 years, and it seems really boring and not fun. Um, like, how do you manage that with your part of your time, especially when you're so busy and, and working and all this kind of stuff? Sure, sure, yes. Yeah. So the short answer is yes, absolutely. Yeah. So graduate school, it's super hard work, but it's kind of flex time. I mean, you got to be in the lab at certain times, you got to do work, but yeah. you can also go play. So I was in Berkeley for grad school, and I went to Yosemite like every other weekend as I was all into rock climbing at the time. Right. And I got tons of time out. You know, and I was, took my laptop with me, and I was sitting there in the campground, and I was coding <laughs> MATLAB and analyzing data when we weren't climbing. 
Um, but I got a lot of good times that way. That's when I learned to surf, actually, is when I lived in California. Yeah. Spent some time in Colorado as a postdoc, went back, or skate skiing, like cross country skiing every couple mornings before work, because mm -hmm. no one cared if I showed up at eight or nine or 10, yeah. as long as I put in a full day. And so I would wake up super early and I'd drive up to the ski area and I'd ski for a couple hours. Cool. Um, and then same thing here, you just gotta find things you can do. You know, you probably can't take off for like months at a time and yeah, travel yeah. the world, right? You gotta be there, you gotta be working, you gotta be connected, but you don't have to be like working 100% of the time. And I don't actually think you're productive if you work 100% of the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. Because pretty soon you're just surfing the web and you're at work, but you're just, you know, yeah, yeah, hanging out on the internet. So re figure out what your what your habits are. And like, I write really well in the morning. I code really well in the morning. I have this right. thing called like dangerous late afternoon coding. If I'm trying to write my lab <laughs> past like 2 p.m., it's just garbage. And I spend the whole next day fixing bugs. Yeah. So I code from like 6 a.m. to 2 and then I stop. And I have meetings for a couple hours, and then I go home and I have dinner with the family. I don't even look at my computer or internet in the evening. I totally okay. unplug in the evening because I find I sleep better that way. Yeah. Which means I can wake up sometimes at 3 or 4 in the morning totally refreshed. You don't have to, but that's just when I wake up. If I didn't stay up late, hanging out with blue screens and hanging out with like input that keeps me all stressed out all night. Yeah. You know, I just turn it off after dinner, go to bed early when the kids go to bed, wake up super early, have that uninterrupted morning time to get stuff done. Other people, the opposite, right? They work evenings. Yeah. They yeah. sleep in, Imo Todorov, he's, he's in his own company now, but I mean, he would never show up before 2 p.m., but he stayed up all night coding, right? <laughs> Basically yeah. what you need is like, you need that private productive time when people aren't bugging you. It usually happens in the off hours and then you need a little bit of time in the middle of the day when people can find you yeah. and interact and you gotta find your own sweet spot. And you don't really have to work more than eight hours a day if those eight hours are productive. Right? Right. If you have eight productive hours a day, five days a week even, I mean, I used to work six or seven days a week when I was an assistant professor, but I realize now I can get it all done pretty much in 40 hours if every hour counts. Yeah. Right. That means no jacking off. Right. For right. some, if I do, then I got to work in the evening on the weekend or something to make up for it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But if you figure out your productive schedule and then you schedule in the play time, so you're like, and you, then you're more productive. You're like, if I get this done by four o'clock, I can go see my friends for whatever ultimate, whatever right. you like to do. Right. Yeah. Then, then you get it done. But if you've got all night to work on it, then you just kind of dribble away and waste all those hours. Right? Yeah. So figure out that, that like sweet spot for productivity. Because cool. your brain doesn't probably work really hard more than 40 hours a week anyway. So yeah. just actually use all 40 and then play the other number of hours that you're awake and then you'll be super happy. Awesome. Cool. All right. Well, thank you so much for, you know, being here and answering all these questions. It was super fun. Yeah, my uh, pleasure. Always love talking to you. Yeah, So, uh, yeah. I don't know. I don't have a good ending. I need a good podcast ending. I think you know? a good ending. Come see us next time for something. I don't know. Do you have a... You, you have like a good uh, CNT slogan, <sighs> catchphrase. Catchphrase. I'm trying to think if it's on the shirt. No. Um, <laughs> no. Our old one was connecting brains and technology, which I really liked. We really like help the body heal, feel, and move again. That was our metal one. Our current one is something about engineering or plasticity, but I can't remember how it goes. So All I don't right. think I do. So you know what? Um, we'll just say this is an ending, guys. Goodbye. My name is Osman Khan. I was with. Dr. Chet Morris today, you can read more about his work online and um, you should probably get into similar work because it's cool. Yeah, thanks a lot. Keep in touch. Yeah, all right. Awesome. That was great. That was yeah. a lot of fun. Sorry I only scheduled an hour. Originally it was yeah. an hour and a half and then somebody just crept in. Somebody wanted a meeting at 3.